everybody, and welcome to The Prognard. I'm your host, Jacob Williams. Today we're going to be looking at Cuba Libre, and the first thing I want to do is state that this is a strategy video. There are lots of other uh, reviews, unboxing, and um, other historical information on Cuba Libre. The thing that I'm going to be focusing on with this video is strategy, and more specifically, strategy for the government. So what this video is mostly meant to do is anyone looking to up their game, or they're uh, new to the system and they don't even know where to begin, uh, that's kind of what this video is for. Uh, just to reiterate, it's not a review, not a um, rules explanation, uh, even though I will cover some rules, it's going to be a fairly rules light. Again, I'm focusing on the strategy. Uh, late night gamer, uh, games in the classroom, uh, uh, Bart Brunsheen from the Dice Tower Network, a lot of them have reviews and unboxings and this sort of thing, and I think that's going to be a better source for that. So with that said, uh, this is going to be a video based on strategy tips for the government player for Cuba Libre. So uh, maybe why you should listen to my strategy advice. Cuba Libre is probably my favorite coin game. Um, sometimes it's I go back and forth between Andy and Abyss and Cuba Libre, but I'm pretty sure Cuba Libre kind of uh, takes top billing for me. I've played probably half a dozen uh, solo games, uh, half a dozen or so face-to-face -face games, so I'm not the uh, be-all, end-all expert on this, but I think I have come up with some tips and ideas that would uh, you know help out. Obviously check Board Game Geek in the uh, strategy forum for uh, Cuba Libre, you know, for maybe some more in-depth stuff. So please don't take anything I say here as the gospel. It's, you know, some suggested strategies and things I've picked up from uh, my mini games. Um, just real quick before I get started, I'm shooting this on a Samsung Galaxy Note uh, 4. Uh, no tripod, so I apologize if things are shaky. I don't have any professional mics or anything. Uh, you know, it is the best that I can do given the limitations that I have. So I apologize for uh, audio video issues up front. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. To keep this a little structured, I've printed out a little talking points sheet where I'm going to kind of go over victory conditions, path to victory, propaganda around faction strengths, faction weaknesses, capabilities, and momentums, and then critical events that you need to keep out for. So, starting off with victory condition, the government has to get total support above 19. Um, I mean, if you're in the final propaganda round, um, 18 is kind of your quote-unquote victory after the whole game. But to get that instant victory on a propaganda round, you have to be 19 or higher. Okay, and on top of that, you have to have every city, which includes Havana, uh, Camagüey, and Santiago de Cuba under government control and active support. Uh, the only city that starts the game like that is Havana. <clears throat> so both of those have to be going for you in order to win the game, either on the final uh, scoring or on the victory uh, phase of a propaganda card. Uh, what do I think is the best way to get to victory? Uh, I'm going to say that your path to victory really depends on two provinces. Either Las Villas, which is your primary one, or Oriente. Okay. Now, why are those spaces so critical? Well, they both have two population. Okay. And that's what makes them uh, critical. I, the reason why I put Las Villas as the most important uh, province is because you already start with three troop cubes there, which means that it'll be essential uh, for placing a base there at some point in the game, hopefully within the first campaign. Now, uh, just I might use some terminology here and there like a campaign. Uh, in the coin community, 
campaign is usually uh, used to refer to the time between uh, propaganda cards. So when you first start the game, you're in the first campaign, and then after you resolve the first propaganda card, you're in the second campaign. So hopefully within the first or second campaign, you're going to get your base in Las Vias. I think players who play the government underestimate how important bases are. I know I certainly have in coin games. What's going to happen is during a propaganda round, all of your troops have to come back to a city, okay? Which means you're going to leave this uncontrolled or give it, put it under control of whoever uh, else happens to be there. So what you're really aiming to do at some point is do a train and then train in Las Vias. Not that you're going to get more cubes there, but you'll be able to replace two with a base, okay? And that's essentially what you want to do because once you get a base there, these troops don't have to leave at the end of propaganda rounds because there's already a base. And because you control it, or hopefully you control it once your base is there, you'll be able to move police there during the propaganda rounds, which once you have police, troops, and control, now you can do those civic actions. Now, another reason why Las Vias is so important, and this goes the same for Oriente, is that it's two population, so that means when you bring it into active support, okay, and to really appreciate this, uh, I need to put a couple more counters down. So let's say you get Las Vias in control, or control and active support. You get Santiago de Cuba in active support, and you get Camagüey in active support. Let's count up how much support that is. You get 12 for Havana, uh, four for uh, Las Vias, so that brings you up to 16. Two for Camagüey brings you up to 18. And two for Santiago de Cuba brings you up to 20. And as we discussed earlier, 20 support will let you get that auto victory in the propaganda route. So that's the reason why I like Las Vias. All of this uh, is the same for Oriente. Uh, are there any advantages to Las Vias over Oriente besides the fact that you start with troops there? Not really. Both places have their drawbacks, okay? Oriente is a forest province, so that means that your sweeps are going to be less effective. You need two troop cubes to uh, flip up uh, one gorilla. So having that two to one sweep ratio uh, is very bad. Uh, but also in the mountains, though, you need, on the assault, you need two cubes uh, for every one gorilla you're going to eliminate. So both places have their drawbacks. Maybe given those operation uh, limitations, I would say Las Vias is slightly better because if you sweep, uh, you're preventing uh, uh, terrorism and uh, assassinations and kidnappings and things like that. So maybe sweeping is a little more important, but it also depends on events. I know there's a few events that key off of Las Vegas, and it's real easy for 26 July and uh, Directorio to get in there. So those are some things to be aware of. So uh, when we're talking about the path to victory, I really do believe Las Vegas is the key. And think about another strategic component. Las Vegas is roughly in the middle. It's got three provinces on the left and three provinces on the right. So uh, it's a good in the middle point. It's a good place to stage troops. Um, you can sweep into Montanzas or uh, Camagüey. Camagüey is going to be a critical spot for the Directorio. Uh, another good positive about Las Vias and even Oriente is Camagüey province. Uh, a lot of threat that I see coming from other players in cities is obviously Havana is always a target with its six population. And I've seen games where 26 July is able to swarm Santiago de Cuba with their base in Sierra Maestra, or maybe they get a good event or they have a good uh, a couple of unanswered um, infiltrates in Santiago de Cuba. And then all of a sudden you're looking at a, kidnap situation 
which I'm going to discuss in faction weaknesses, you cannot afford to be kidnapped. Okay. Um, that's one thing you really have to look to prevent. So, um, that's, you're really in danger then Santiago to Cuba. But the reason why those two, another reason why those two cities are harder, harder or hotter targets is because even though Directorio starts out here in Camagüey province, their targets are more juicy in other provinces. And Camagüey City just isn't as juicy as a Tupop Las Vias or Tupop Oriente. So this city has a little bit of natural protection that isn't maybe obvious um, uh, when you first uh, play the game. Okay, so... That's I'm going to wrap up Path to Victory um, with that, is that your Path to Victory is Havana, Las Vegas, Camagüey City, and Santiago de Cuba. Possibly swapping out Oriente. And look, maybe if you're really lucky, you can keep uh, Pinar del Rio in active support, and maybe you get into Montanzas or La Habana um, for a quick little victory. Uh, my experience is Pinar del Rio stays in active support probably into the third campaign, but late in the game it's going to change and uh, there's not going to be much you can do about it, especially when they play, what is it, either Fisherman or the 12, I forget which card, but it lets them go directly into, lets 26 July go directly into Pinar del Rio um, and then they start terrorizing it and um, it all goes to hell. Um, let me put one other thing here, even though this isn't really path to victory. I'm going to, this is kind of like a cautionary tale. And this applies to all coin games in general, but I, I've seen it a lot in Cuba Libre specifically, because I try to use Cuba Libre as my learning coin game whenever I'm trying to get new people into the system. One thing you can't do with any coin game is... You cannot be laser focused on your victory condition. And let me scoot that back down to where it starts. You can't be laser focused on your victory condition. I've seen a lot of new players. You know, I tell them, okay, you're playing the government. You're trying to get total support above uh, 18. You know, uh, so th that's what you need to do. And then what they think that means is I need to train and civic action every chance I get. And I've seen players who will start the game. Uh, maybe Havana is a bad example, but let's... Santiago de Cuba starts neutral. What they'll do is... <clears throat> they'll train as their first action, or first full action they get. You know, they'll put some things in there. And then they're like, oh, I'm going to go ahead and buy a civic action. I'm going to go all out and put it into active support. Because they know that part of their winning condition is all three cities have to be government-controlled active support along with uh, total support being 19 or higher. So they'll do this. And then what they'll forget is I left a uh, 26 July gorilla there. So 26 July simply pays one resource and terrorizes and flips this down. So what happened there was the gorillas have a four to one advantage. It takes them one resource to change the support level and it takes you four resources to affect the support level. That's just a game you cannot win. So don't really even think about civic actions until your cities are in a condition that's gonna support that civic action because there's absolutely no sense in putting all those precious resources to building up support just to have it torn down by one limb op, basically. <coughs> uh, excuse me. Okay. So, that's just a pro tip. You have to, you can't just be laser focused on your victory conditions. You have to make sure you're setting the foundation for a solid win when the opportunity presents itself. This isn't a Euro game or anything like that where you can just be laser focused on victory like that. Okay, enough of uh, that rambling. Um, let's see, let's look at our next talking point, the propaganda round. Okay, 
what are some key things to think about for the propaganda rounds? I would say first and foremost, you need to worry about the skim. Um, if you'll recall from the rules, the skim is where you get to steal syndicate resources because you control the area where an open casino is. So throughout your rounds, you want to be careful, like especially when you do assaults, because what you want to do is like in Havana, for example, you want to assault these two directorio guerrillas, but you don't want to close the casino. Okay, because you want to get the skim off of that in the propaganda rounds. Um, and kind of foreshadowing onto fact, faction weakness is you are going to have a serious cash problem in the uh, late game. So you got to get resources everywhere you can. All right. And a lot of that starts in the propaganda round by uh, the skim in casinos. Uh, let me back up. I think an important thing about the propaganda round is that's the main place you're going to get resources. So how does uh, government get resources? Well, you're going to get them by counting aid plus the economic value of all unsabotaged ECs. Uh, sorry if I did a bad job of getting that in frame, but that's how you are going to get resources. So any opportunity you get to get aid uh, higher, that's going to be uh, good. Uh, any chance you can to garrison to get gorillas out of your ECs, that's going to be a good thing. Now when I say that, you can kind of let syndicate gorillas go there because they won't sabotage the EC. What you have to be aware of when syndicate gorillas get in the ECs is that um, they're going to get cash as well and part of their victory condition is getting over uh, 30 uh, resources but directorio or 26 july in there uh, they can sabotage it and uh, screw you out of those resources in the propaganda round uh, with the directorio there's a little less priority because they don't kidnap but if the 26 july gets in there, uh, you have a serious problem and you need to try to garrison as soon as possible to get them out of there. And that sucks. Sometimes you really want to do something else other than garrison, but that's how it goes. You got to keep those ECs clear for the propaganda rounds. Uh, maybe a good idea if you, if you ever have a full turn. And what I mean by a full turn is you get an operation plus special activity. That's what I call a full turn. Um, you will want to garrison if you have nothing better to do just to get one or uh, one or two police in every ECs. You park a couple of police there, uh, gorillas tend to not go in there. That's been my experience. Uh, so resources, those are critical in the propaganda round. Uh, another thing that you have to be aware of in the propaganda round is this U.S. Alliance track. Uh, what this does is if you don't meet... Uh, if you don't, if basically, if you're not in your winning condition, uh, this marker is going to move down. Yes, I know there is technically instances where you could have support above 18 and not be winning the game. That would be a situation where maybe you don't control one of the cities or one of the cities is not in active support. So it is possible, but generally speaking, um, if you're not winning the game, this is going to go down. And every time that goes down one space you're going to lose uh, 10 uh, resources and eight now luckily that's not going to affect you until the next campaign but it also means that your uh, operations are going to be more expensive per space uh, going in because initially your uh, operations cost two per space then three per space and then four per space and you lose airstrike so these are some things to be aware of in the propaganda round. There's not much you can do about this unless you're winning, but it kind of puts the government on a uh, timer, okay? And we'll cover more of that in faction weaknesses. All right, uh, what else do we wanna talk about with propaganda round? Uh, when you have to do your troop redeployment, uh, this is, I think, something that a lot of new people misunder misunderstand. So let's go back to uh, Las Vegas. We start the game controlling it. And let's say we have an early prop card or it's maybe the first card. What a lot of people don't realize is the way they read these 
player aids and at least with the first printing which is what i have i haven't looked at the second printing but the way the player aid reads it almost makes it sound like you have to move your troops out which makes you lose control and then you can move police in where you have coin control but because you had to move troops out you lost coin control and you can't move cops there that's not how it works you may want to think of this as uh, something you can do simultaneously and I looked at the new uh, rules book for the second printing and I think they did a better job of saying you can move your police to places where you have control so like I can move to here and then you redeploy troops like that so now I've maintained control there and I've got police there which the prop card, generally speaking, is about the only way you can move police around. Um, I've held control with police, and then maybe in the next campaign I can use a transport or something, get into Las Vegas, and then at some point I can buy civic actions. So let's talk about civic actions. You get to do that in the support uh, phase of the propaganda card. Now, what a civic action does is it allows you to spend resources in places where you have troops, police, and government control. You have to meet all three of those conditions. And for every four resources you spend, you can remove a terror marker. So if there was a terror marker, I can remove it. And then for every four resources after that, I can move the um, support one level closer to active support, okay? Now, in the first propaganda round, I like to go ahead and get Camagüey and Santiago de Cuba into active support if I have the resources and if I've removed guerrillas. Because again, I don't want to spend resources and have underground guerrillas there that can just screw it up on the next uh, action round. That's something you want to avoid. Sometimes it makes sense not to buy government action or uh, civic actions in this phase, if, especially if there's a lot of terror markers here, because terror markers are not limited to one in this game. Um, I think in Fire in the Lake they're limited to one per space, but not in this game. They can You can have as many as you want in one province, and that gets expensive. And remember, in the reset phase, you're going to remove all terror markers and sabotage markers anyway, so sometimes it makes sense to just not buy a civic action uh, during one propaganda round and then wait for the next one or wait until your next training uh, act or operation, then go ahead and buy those civic actions because you can't go throwing resources away, which is what we'll get to in faction weaknesses. Uh, I think that's a pretty good job of talking about the propaganda round. So let's move on to faction strengths. I would say the government's biggest strength is, is the power of their operations. And you can see this theme throughout the uh, coin series, okay? Um, and what do I mean by the power of their operations? Well, the government's assault will eliminate one active guerrilla for every uh, troop cube you have. Whereas the guerrillas have to roll a die and they have to get under a number. It's much harder for them to attack. So your uh, operation that eliminates pieces is so much stronger than any other factions. You also have a little bit more mobility with your special activities like uh, transport. You have sweep, which will uh, make gorillas become activated. Usually gorillas can't activate each other. That's slightly outweighed with the fact that they can eliminate other gorillas without them being active. But... Generally speaking, the uh, abilities of the government tend to be a little bit stronger than every other faction, uh, which makes sense because they pay more for their actions, and that'll dovetail us into faction weaknesses. The government has a serious, serious, serious resource problem, okay? In the beginning, it doesn't start off too bad, paying two resources per space and you already have a ton of resources you start off with um, the most tied with the syndicate but as the game goes on when things start costing three and four it's a really bad situation i would say that the government really needs to try to win in the second propaganda round 
to have the best shot at winning. I've seen governments win in the fourth propaganda round and even in the final scoring. It's more rare. Usually the syndicate is winning um, that late in the game. So if you can wrap it up by getting Las Vegas and your cities under control, that's your best bet because you are going to have a serious cash problem later on. And their other main faction weakness is their special activities aren't as good. Um, I would say you effectively have two special activities, which is transport and airstrike. And remember, you lose airstrike if you ever get into the embargo region on the uh, U.S. alliance track. Now, you technically have three special activities, but I never see a lot of players using reprisal. That's probably because it only affects uh, one cube. You have to add a terror marker, and adding terror markers is counterproductive to what you need. So those would be the two faction weaknesses, in my opinion, is that they have a serious money problem and their special activities aren't as good as other players. All right, and then let's talk a little bit about the actual cards and events. So let's talk about capabilities and momentums. So I kind of put some cards out here that I've identified that I really want to talk about. Talking about momentums, the government has no capabilities like other coin games. They have these things called momentums, which uh, reset at the end of propaganda rounds. Now, I personally don't like momentums, and I play with a few players that do. But the reason why I don't like momentums is because this game is all about action economy. I think I read in an interview that Andrew Runke, uh, Volko Runke's brother, when they were designing Falling Sky, I think they talked about how what they see is the faction that wins most often is the one that gets to take the most full turns. So the person who gets the most um, op plus specials. So if you're taking an event, you're losing out on a chance to take an op plus special, generally speaking, if you're uh, first eligible, which on these momentum cards, all except for Raul, the government is first eligible on. So when do I think momentums make the most sense, uh, given that you have to trade an action to get them? I would say they make sense if you had an early prop in, in one campaign and you suspect that you will have a late campaign um, before the next propaganda card. So basically long campaigns where if you're wasting an action or a full turn now, that that's going to pay dividends because the uh, momentums are that good. And I've actually kind of ranked them in what I think are the best momentums. This one with the uh, adding assault as a, uh, special activity to sweep. I think that's extremely powerful and one that's worth taking, you know, given that you're going to have a long enough campaign. Uh, map is uh, still pretty good that you can do a special activity with a limb op. Kind of allows you to get more full turns in. And then uh, just kind of going down to what I think are the worst. And armored cars, it's the first card in the game. I just don't think it's all that great. I don't know. Uh, I just never really see uh, mobility as a real problem with the government, especially given you have the transport special activity or you can just airstrike. All right. Uh, let's talk about critical events. I have kind of have five events out here that I think are critical that you need to keep an eye out to make sure that they don't happen or that you can mitigate them or something. Um, I've kind of broken them out into two columns. These are the three cards that I think are important because they affect the government uh, or the U.S. Alliance track. All three of these have the ability to shift the U.S. Alliance up, okay, which is really critical. I think this is a little unorthodox, but I try to use these in situations where I can move the alliance up, okay? Now, some of these you have to be careful because, let's see, was it a coup? 
where you shift all government control spaces one uh, level towards neutral and then the U.S. alliance uh, up one. Now that can be dangerous in a situation like this where you already have Havana under uh, active support because you don't want that moving to neutral just to get your U.S. alliance up. But let's say uh, you are paying attention and uh, general strike was able to happen where you shift all cities uh, to neutral, uh, then, you know, doing a coup makes sense because they're already in neutral. So whatever, you just leave them in neutral and you shift that box up one. So don't be afraid to play any of these three cards for their unshaded. Unshaded typically favors gorillas, but in certain circumstances, they can be really good for the government as well. Um, election is an event that uh, uh, can be bad for you if you select a uh, city neutral, but you get 8 plus 10. Um, maybe that wasn't as critical as I thought. It maybe shouldn't have been in there, but oh well. Uh, and then General Strike, I already explained, getting all those cities to neutral is really bad. Uh, I don't know that I have too much else to talk about. We covered all of the points on the strategy talking points outline. So, again, I'm Jacob Williams uh, with the Prognard. And uh, if you like this uh, and find this helpful, I maybe will go ahead and make a strategy guide for the other three factions. Uh, this is my first video on this channel, just trying it out and seeing if anyone likes it. And if you do, maybe I will go ahead and uh, make some more videos. Just let me know in the comments or email me and let me know what you think. All right, thanks a lot.